and right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being here as part of the KPFT family. Folks, we're going to have a great show for you today. You will love it because we have a special guest. Anyway, we are going to get right into it. Start in. David Cobb on decolonizing economics. A leak on Discord proves the TikTok bans a fraud. Guns struck again. David Cobb on decolonizing economics. David Cobb is a prolific political, social justice, racial justice, environmental justice activist, and the people's lawyer. Join us. He joins us to talk about decolonize the decolonizing economic summit. You know, David and I go back a long time from Move to Amend to many other places and all kind of organizations. And of course, he's been doing this for decades. David Cobb continues his tireless work to affect positive democratic change. He is one of the key organizers of the Decolonizing Economic Summit, a three-day conference that serves as a space to exchange experiences and information, strengthen alliances and networks, devise strategies to decenter colonial uh, systems and implement concrete solutions to heal the land and people. Over a thousand people participated in 2022 and even more are expected in 2023. And without further ado, David Cobb, how are you doing, my brother? Oh, Egberto, hello, or hey. howdy, as we say in Texas. It is such a pleasure to hear your voice. It's a pleasure to hear yours, man. You know, uh, I, anytime I hear you, I get spirited. I get, you know, I, I always, let me let me put it this way, because like I told told you, we go, go back a long time, and we've spent working, moved to a man, locked into homes, devising strategies all over this country, and there's one thing I can say about David Cobb. And that he is, he's always inspiring and not only inspiring, because inspiring is not enough, he's always there with concrete policies that say, if we do this. So anyhow, welcome to Politics Done Right, my brother. Talk to me. Well, thank you so much, Egberto, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to KPFT listeners. Uh, for folks who may remember back in the day, I am a native Houstonian myself. I've been on KPFT Airways many times as a guest and a host. Uh, it is... Uh, my original community radio station. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm especially excited to share that this Decolonizing Economic Summit is online and virtual. So if anything you hear inspires and entices you, you can participate simply by going to the website decolonizingeconomicsummit.org. That's two S's there. The economics is plural. Uh, and join us. It's completely free. You can make a donate, free will donation, KPFT style if you can, but the point is it is free. And as you said, Egberto, the whole point of this is to come together to develop a shared analytical framework and to make plans that we can implement. Uh, because, you know, I often say that theory without practice is mere contemplation. There you go. Practice without theory is just doing stuff. You know, you might do something transformational without a plan, but it'll be by accident. So the point is, how do we get sharpen our analysis about what we want, and then how do we develop plans to get there? And where I have been spending the majority of my time is around what the great philosopher Andre Gorse called non-reformist reform. That is to say, things that we can do right now to make people's lives better, to win achievable reforms, but as part of a strategic plan to undermine the logic of capital, to undermine the power of the billionaire class. And those non-reformist reforms include but are not limited to public banking, participatory budgeting, worker-owned cooperatives, community land trust, universal basic income, locally owned energy production and distribution models. The point is, Egberto, the point is, KPFT listeners, these things are happening in various spots all across the country. What we're trying to do is cohere a broad movement to democratize the economy. Now, anybody who uh, goes to that website, because again, like, uh, first of all, like David said, it is free. It's a free conference over three days. We'll actually see the number, you know, I, every time I go there, it seems like the number increases, the number of participants 
uh, grassroots and other groups that make up a part of this this network that you're putting together. Like you said, last year you had a thousand people. You're likely to have close to two thousand this year, which is sort of a wonderful thing to see that people are realizing that we re. You know, something that we've been preaching here, David, and I want you to pick up on this for me, is that a lot of people are feeling down. You know, they feel like they don't have that they can't make a difference. It's it's all over. We just have to oblige by what's going on now. Uh, you, it, you've you always been able to show folks that, no, it, it is just going to be what you make it to be. Why don't you expand on that? Well, thank you, Egberto. And I'll, I'll, look, I'll be very candid and transparent with you and KPFT listeners, and that is this. It depends on what side of the bed I get up on. Mm-hmm. Because some days I get up and I think, oh, my God, there's no way that we can win. The billionaire class has all the power. And they spend billions of dollars every year to suppress our ideas, uh, to, to propagandize people, and to, and to disempower us, and to distract us, right? And there's just no way we can overcome that. But then other days, I get up on the other side of the bed, and I think, there's no way we can lose. It takes them billions of dollars to try to keep people so distracted from what they really want in their hearts, what they know in their head we really need. So I intentionally try to get up on that side of the bed every day with the knowledge that people before us have faced even more insurmountable odds. And I mean that clearly. Like, let's look at it. From the abolition of slavery, women getting the right to vote, the creation of the Social Security Administration or unemployment insurance, workers' compensation laws, pure food and drug laws, the labor movement. For goodness sakes, Egberto, the entire history of this country has been people who face bluntly longer odds than we're facing now, and by engaging in serious strategic thinking, collective organizing, they made transformational change. We can do it, too. Absolutely so. And, uh, you know, when you said it depends on what side of your bed you get off, right? I'm like, well, somehow it must be that I only find you when you get off on that, that other side of the bed. Because <laughs> I've, I've never heard the other part before. Hey, it depends on what side of the bed I, I get up. But, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that I am starting to see effectively uh, over the last several, and not only the last several months, but over the last several years, a larger percentage of people engaging, which is, I remember you and I sitting down talking and you said, Egberto, if we get to, I think the night number was 3%. Uh, you said uh, at 3%, you know, we, we really have that movement that's actually, uh, that, that is actually probative. Your thoughts on that or your comments on that? Yeah, well, that, that's actually, that 3% comes out of the work of Gene Sharp, uh, mm-hmm. who studied revolutionary processes. And what, what I, and I, again, I want to, uh, in the spirit of the great African revolutionary Amakal Kalabar, uh, mask no difficulties, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. Uh, because we are seeing a 3% uh, tipping point of folks, not just who agree with us, but who are willing to collectively act in concert. I'll tell you this, Egberto, our, the left, and I mean explicitly the left, not just soft left liberals, but the left, I believe we have enough power and capacity to greatly influence the U.S. empire. I don't think that we're in a position to overtake it at this moment, but we could absolutely have so much more uh, import and effect. But the problem is that we are not sufficiently coordinated. Right. We don't really know each other, and we don't have a program and a plan, right? Exactly. So that's part of what this decolonizing economic summit is, is to bring us together into deep strategy around us. The second thing I want to be candid about is the far right and the fascists are equally approaching uh, that 3% of folks who are ready to throw down. Oh. I say it with clarity mm-hmm. uh, and no... no uh, no happiness, but with sincerity. I believe that we are witnessing the neoliberal center collapsing, and there's either going to be some version of what I'll call eco-socialism or a decolonized return to power with regenerative economics uh, and collaboration and sustainability, or some version of fascism. I just don't see, like, uh, in this historic conjuncture and in this moment, those two things being able 
uh, to coexist. One side or the other will be the dominant narrative of this country and indeed of the world. The thing that concerns me the most when we, when we, as we are talking these issues, right, is how, uh, how, what a large percentage of the population that doesn't see uh, what's really getting ready to happen. And, and a lot of it has to do with us being centralized solely here in the United States and not seeing all the other things that are occurring throughout the world that, 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 that's, that shows that we're in trouble. Your thoughts? Well, I am glad you brought it up and said it so explicitly. Here's my big picture view, Egberto, that we are at the beginning of a global ecological collapse. It's not coming, it's here. It's right. in the beginning stages of true collapse. But wait, there's more, because we're also not just at late-stage capitalism. This is end-stage capitalism. Right, Richard. And by that I mean there's always been internal inherent contradictions of capitalism. But I'm saying something different. I'm saying that today with automation, technology, robotics, that what we're seeing is the mass transformation of social, political, and economic relationships. The ruling elite can no longer extract the surplus value of the worker for profit because we are moving into literally laborless or workerless production. It's beginning. The digital fabrication world, that, that this new era, the reason that you're seeing fascism emerge now is because of the political crisis that's coming. We have an ecological crisis, we have an economic crisis, and those two crises are creating a political crisis. And the political crisis is not that, oh, the ruling class cannot solve racism or sexism. The ruling class of this political system was never designed to do that. I'm saying something different. I'm saying that the current political system cannot actually maintain order. That's why we're seeing the January 6th insurrectionists. Now, I take it as my job, Egberto, to bring as many uh, people as I can into the worldview of eco-socialism and recognizing that there is enough for everybody to not just survive, but to thrive, to live rich and meaningful lives without exploiting anyone, without oppressing anyone, but the fascist worldview of, you know, uh, nationalism and hyper um, militarism, like that's a lie, uh, but it appeals to some segments. So people who are already fascists, I've kind of given up on them, but I am still constantly trying to persuade people to break to progressive populism. You know, it's interesting because I've had this discussion. I, I've interviewed Richard Wolf, economist, Professor Richard Wolf from, I think, Amherst, uh, about three or four times. And every, t every, every time I interview him, it, it comes to, you know, you, you're, you're at the point where you said, my God, we're at end state capitalism. <clears throat> and every time that I've spoken to him, each time, probably six months apart, he comes closer and saying, we're almost there. And we take a look at what's happening on the banking system right now. I have a young man, Patrick, that's going to be discussing this issue called the con that we have going on in our economic system. That, that's all provable, you know. And, and, and when you state it and that you're doing a conference, a summit, to kind of highlight these issues with people, I think it's very important. Tell us a little bit about this summit again for those who are maybe joining us late because I think this is important for people to get there and also what happens after the summit where can people find the information that was developed throughout the summit well thank you for that and I'm happy to tell you that Professor Rick Wolf will literally be on a panel with uh, our good friend Kali Akuno of Great. Cooperation Jackson and others on the subject, what is to be done. Right. Uh, so, uh, and we'll also have Emily Colano, co-coordinator of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have uh, a host of national leaders and thinkers. DecolonizingEconomicSummit.org is an online invitation to strategize what is the world that we want to live in and how do we get there. How do we both decolonize and also meet people's material needs uh, right here, right now? And I'm also happy to tell you, if you register 
it will put you in line to get the recorded sessions of every single one of these sessions. So, folks, so, don't forget, yeah. register where again for that, that, free, uh, that free conference? Decolonizing Economic Summit. Dot and you know, you know, folks, in, <laughs> in this life, there's not a whole lot of free conferences anymore. This is going to be well worth your while. And if you, when you go to that website and see the amount of grassroots organizations that are that are actually doing things, and of course, uh, David played a very important point uh, part in getting all of this organized, as he always has. So, um, so it is it is important, folks, that you go to the website. Sign up as 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 he says. There will be uh, you will be able even if you don't catch it in real time, you'll be able to get all parts at subsequent time. But it's something to be seen. Uh, it, when when we talk when in in this speech or this discussion here, it brings back memory of that documentary that we made, Legalize Democracy. And uh, why don't you? Because I think some of that is in some of the context that we covered, where we went from uh, th th this side this sort of a society that was very very limited in access to for for the for the majority slowly building building up why don't you kind of elaborate some on that and how it relates to what you're doing well thank you for that so uh, listeners as Egberto is referencing he and i and uh, others formed an organization called move to amend which was a reaction to the horrific Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission that did two things. One, uh, it legalized bribery uh, by saying that uh, wealthy individuals and corporations could give unlimited money in elections. It was it was premised on two completely illegitimate, two court created uh, ridiculous ideas. One, that the expenditure of money is the equivalent of speech. Money is property; it's not speech. Uh, I mean, money can amplify speech, which means that the wealthy can shout while the rest of us desperately try to talk to each other. Uh, but the, it's not just that money is speech. It also premised upon the equally odious, equally ridiculous idea that a corporation is a person with inherent and alienable constitutional rights of an individual. So legalized democracy uh, was an effort to teach people the history of not just corporate power, but corporate rule. How the concept of corporate constitutional rights, so-called corporate personhood, has literally made it illegal uh, to have genuine democracy. Because, Egberto, no matter how hard we fight uphill battle uh, to try to get good laws passed, uh, and that's hard enough, but even it, when we do win them, then corporate lawyers can go into court and argue that those laws have somehow violated the constitutional rights of corporations. That doctrine has been used to overturn environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws. There's a whole series of them. And deeper still, Egberto, that concept of the threat of corporate personhood has completely diminished most people's ability to think about what is possible. So part of what we're doing at decolonizingeconomicsummit.org is to say, no, no, we have a vision for a completely different world and a plan to get there. And we're going to have to confront the illegitimate doctors of corporate constitutional rights just as clearly as we had to over overturn the outrageous idea of separate but equal or the idea that women are not people. Like At the end of the day, we're talking about peaceful revolution. Absolutely. So, folks, I want to I want to give a little bit of context to something that you said there with the person uh, corporate personhood. That you know, when we talk in that terminology, David, sometimes we say corporate personhood or co corporations of, as persons, and people don't quite get it. I just want to illustrate to them. I, I don't remember if this is one of the things I had in my book or not, but I told them that I, I usually specify that a corporation, if if we the people pass a law, a local law state law that allows, uh, uh, that prevents a corporation from doing something that we feel is materially wrong for our community, that corporation can turn around and sue as a person that what we are doing is infringing on that corporation's ability to make money or do whatever, and we are liable for said damages as taxpayers to give that private corporations because we abridge their rights, correct? 
That is exactly right. And Egberto, uh, like I, I want to lift up the fact that Egberto Viles is not a lawyer. He's a smart person, uh, but has just profoundly and astutely and accurately described that legal concept. Uh, and it's ridiculous, right? Remember, Egberto and KPFT listeners, that corporations are artificial entities that are created only through uh, the state chartering process. Anybody can form a business, but if you want the privilege, not the right, if you want the privilege of limited liability, which is literally to say we're limiting our liability to expose uh, for uh, legal harms or remedies that we may cause, if you want that privilege, then only the state legislature, through a governmental action, can grant that privilege. So there is no reason that we, the people, through our elected state representatives, cannot say, if you want this privilege, you do not have, as a a group of investors or shareholders, the collective rights. Individual humans have rights, Egberto. Corporations are artificial entities. They're tools, nothing more. They can be used for wonderful things. But more and more, the transnational corporation are used for horrific things. Great. Well, before before I ask you to give us a closer, I want to see if Tori has anything to ask you. Tori is always a good listener. Uh, he's, do, he's doing the engineering for me today. And, uh, you know, he loves the work that you do. So go ahead, Tori. Oh, I've just been a big fan of David Cobb from back when he used to live in Houston. And uh, I remember when he was running for, uh, for president in the Green Party. I mean, this guy is just extremely impressive you know his energy and commitment uh to all things good and he's you're in david you're my you were my favorite green party candidate <laughs> of all well, thank you. that's an incredible that that's an incredible uh, uh compliment and especially you know uh, i'm not going to out you and your your politics by, by using any descriptive words but i can say tory is not usually inspired by any electoral process or a candidate so uh, I take that as a high Ima- compliment you know it's funny David I was about to say that I was about to say if you're getting a compliment from Tori you 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 must have been imp- or you must be impressive <laughs> Well, well, you've been out of the you've been out of the loop for a long time, Dave. I haven't seen you in Houston, and uh, but since I mean, this is like from before before Bernie got into the national scene, running for president. But I've been a Bernie guy for a long time now. So <laughs> anyway, give me a closer. Uh, give me a closer, David. Let's get let's get get on to the other subject. But I will pl- go ahead and let us know how people can get involved with this again. Again, the the it's the decolonizing economic summit. Cleverly, our URL is decolonizingeconomicsummit.org. It's a free conference. Uh, over a thousand people last year. We expect to double that this year. Uh, come and join theorists, strategists, practitioners who are not just thinking about, but actually doing the work to build from the bottom up, uh, eco-socialism from below. Uh, an ability to actually engage electoral politics without becoming electoral fetishists, to build the movement that we so desperately need and so richly deserve to transform this society. And I'm going to say not just to create a new society, but return to the society that we lived in before the enclosure movement, before capitalism and industrialism. Remember, Egberto, remember KPFT, every human being alive today descends from indigenous people. It's our birthright to be in right relationship with each other and with land and sea and our relatives, other living creatures. Well, David, uh, uh, it's one, in our chat here, Alistair said, hey, brother, I just registered. So, uh, you know, hey, I- thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, let me let me tell you, David. It's always my honor to speak to you. Um, uh, I, I, I intend to have you on a hell of a lot of times because you know we need to make sure that people know that they are already empowered as American citizens to be what they want to be and to have what they've earned. So thank you so kindly no for having me. I'm going to conclude with this. Egberto, yes. But it doesn't just have to be during elections, right? Absolutely. It shouldn't be only. Politics to play, but there, it, this work needs to happen in between elections. As My well. God, I'm glad you brought that up. Folks, they, we are supposed to be working continuously on, on, on guiding, speaking, learning, educating 
all of us all together. All right, brother. You have a great one. Thank you, Corey. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Anyway, folks, give us a call, 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. Anything you want to talk about with regards to the conference, anything you want to talk about with regards to the topics, please feel free to give us a call. Today's second topic is a leak on Discord proves the TikTok bans a fraud. And I really mean that. You know, I don't know if any of you ever use Discord, but Discord is just yet another plat- uh, chatting type platform that we use in, in, in I mean, it's it's sort of used not only in the rebel space, but in the in, in, the, in the strategizing space. It's also used in the uh, grassroots uh, space. I use it along with um, some of the work that we do in, in, in different domains. So uh, here, here the, here's the deal. Um, somehow, some believe that TikTok was a problem. But we learned from some of these leaked papers that TikTok is just a diversion. But anyhow, let's go with it this way. A leak on Discord proves the TikTok bans a fraud. A few weeks ago, I wrote about the TikTok distraction. The leak of classified information on Discord proves that the enemy is really not without, but within. The response by several MAGA Republicans about Jack Teixeira's leaked classified documents proves that even further. The Washington Post article, Discord leaks suggest China doesn't need TikTok to find U.S. secrets, is probative. This is how it starts. On March 23rd, lawmakers crowded into a packed capital here in room to harangue the CEO of the social app TikTok about the company's Chinese ownership and the risk it posed to U.S. national security. Months earlier, President Biden had signed a bill banning TikTok from federal employees' devices to prevent sensitive information from falling into the wrong hands. Before I continue, folks, please give us a call, 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. Hit extension number two. All lines are open, so you can get on right away. You can get on to agree, disagree, complain, uncomplain, and do whatever you choose to do, because as I mentioned all of the times, this is your show. All right. What the members of Congress didn't know was that state secrets had been trickling out for months on social media and were beginning to circulate in ever wider online forums, not on TikTok, but on U.S.-owned Discord, which is something that I pointed out in several articles. We talk about how we are so scared that the, that, that China is going to be collecting information from TikTok. But that has never been something for us to really worry about in any material form. And I'll talk about that a little later. later. Anyway, uh, in the two weeks after the TikTok hearing, those classified documents would make their way into public view on U.S.-owned Twitter and remain there for days as owner Elon Musk mocked the idea that he ought to remove them. Let's go ahead and bring it, Jack Haiti in, and then we'll continue with uh, this story. Jack, come on in. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, Berto. Good morning. Good morning, uh, my brother. Talk to I me. Was, I was just going to draw a parallel between this, you know, the ability of the corporations to sue uh, entities for uh, the people for profit. Yes. And that this is what Haiti is suffering under after the colonization of the French and the, and the Haiti rebellion. Oh, yes. The world is seeking reparations on the Haiti people now. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think people understand what you're saying here. Let me, let me break that down a little bit, Jack. Okay, Haiti. I'll listen on the air. No, 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 Don't leave. I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to leave because there's okay. more I want to ask okay. you. Here's the deal. This is important. When Toussaint Lavatour liberated the slaves in Haiti, okay? Yes. It wasn't just a liberation of the slaves. The French came back with, not bombers then, but ships 
and threaten this new established country, first established country. If you want to remain free, you will pay reparations for you as formerly products, assets. You have to pay for your freedom because remember, you used to be assets. The land used to be assets. Now you have to repay France for having enslaved you in Haiti and you liberating yourself. That is what it means. Is that, is that what you're talking about, Jack? Pretty much. I mean, it's a pretty sick scenario, but pretty much, yeah, that's it. What a lot of people don't understand is that it happened in the United States as well. It I happened, can see it. It happened in the United States because guess what? Many slave owners sued for, uh, for reparations for slavery, and guess what? They got it. The corporations love it, don't they? Yeah. You know, so I mean, okay. it, you know, it, it's important, Jack. I think uh, I think uh, uh, Tori wants to say something. Tori. Yeah. One of the worst parts, uh, probably maybe the worst part of the reparations that uh, France got. This was back in the days of the wooden ships and empires and France was competing with England uh, for a navy. Uh, one of the things that France demanded from Haiti was all their timber. They denuded that half an entire half of that uh, island, for wood. you know, for wood, so they can make ships to compete with Britain. And you know, uh, you know, the topsoil got uh, eroded from the rain after all the forests were gone, and it's just raped that land. I mean, it's just terrible what they did to the land. And that's one of the types of poverty in Haiti is environmental poverty because of the reparations France taking entire forests, clear cutting the land in Haiti. Yeah, so I mean, Jack, you know, like I said, I have some of the smartest listeners and, you know, so thank you for bringing that up because I think that is something that very few people know. And, 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 the, and the thing about it is while, while all those issues covered uh, things like slavery or skin color, you know, for, for those of you who listen to my show, I always talk now about antiseptic slavery. And when I talk about antiseptic slavery, I, I talk, it, it actually refers to things that corporations now have the power to do over us by law. So thank you for bringing that up, Jack. Anything else you want to add before you go? Uh, yeah, I had a thought. Let me see if I can, I can uh, bring it back. Um, it was about, you know, okay, you can, you can, I, I've heard this, but you can, you can fly over Haiti mm -hmm. and the Dominican Republic and you can see the change in color from the forested side oh, yeah. to the, so, I have seen um, it my, with my own eyes on my tr on my trip to Punta Cana, uh, Dominican Republic. And, and, yes, and I also want to point out, you know, along with this force of empire, you know, the um, when the Americas were settled, you know, they almost wiped out all the indigenous populations and the indigenous populations of the animals that the that the indigenous people lived yeah, on the buffalo etc yeah. yes 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 so this is the force of empire exactly that's, that's right my comment you know well thank you so kindly jack for always having something uh, to say anyway folks give us a call 713-526-5738 again that number is 281 <laughs> 713-526-5738 i was about to throw my cell phone number i've been just just throwing things all over i had a whole lot of calls that i had to send in today it is amazing but anyhow folks i want to thank you guys for listening let me continue with the 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 assessment on tiktok that we were speaking about for those who are just joining us tiktok as as it's not really the problem okay let's go to line two bring in alistair alistair come on in how are you doing my sister hey brother okay before we get back on the tiktok yes i need to talk about how you know with the reparations the french ordered for hate from haiti and yes all yes. of that for lost assets um and how we have people in our country asking for reparations mm -hmm. because of, you know, serious, serious uh, problems mm -hmm. from being enslaved. Right. The, one of the arguments on against reparations is where do we start? Mm -hmm. And I think the best place to start is, well, how much money was paid by former slaves to their 
and flavors mm-hmm. when they re- when they got their freedom. Mm-hmm. That's a great place to start. Yeah, I mean, they're... And then, you know, figuring, oh, I don't know, the yeah. the cost of living over years, and you know, the value of the dollar over the years, and it can be dispersed. You, you know, the you int- know. the interesting thing, Alistair, right, is a, 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 a listener called or, or contacted me once. Uh, I had mentioned the word reparation on this show. And I don't talk about uh-huh. reparation a whole lot, but I think I was talking about the ADAS movement, etc. And when I when I brought, he, he wrote me a letter and he said, I am a big supporter of politics done right and all of that, but you, you lost me. He, he didn't mean he stopped listening. He said, but you lost me with your commentary on reparations. What and he he asked the same question you asked. Where do we start? How do we handle that? Right? Uh oh, Alistair, we accidentally uh, knocked you off. We'll pick you up. Uh, I mean, just call back and we'll pick you back up. Whoop! We just lost another one again. Oh my God! All right, folks, uh, we're having a little bit of of telephone problems. Please call back. Please call back. We'll get that fixed. Please call back. Uh, Five zero four. Come on in. Hello. Yeah. It's Ray. Ray, talk to me, Ray. Yeah, uh, Egberto, uh, just wanted to highlight that interview you had. Yes. With, uh, David Mary Cobb. Williamson. Oh, with Williamson. Okay. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. I actually wanted to speak on it some, some time ago, but you know, my schedule, I just had, had gotten to it. But Mr. Cobb, uh, I did catch, uh, some of what he was saying and, and it's some deep stuff, but, um, going back to that interview with Marion Williamson. Yes. Um, as pertains to our, uh, political system, you know, I, I find it, you know, brave that she is, you know, going against the establishment. And as a Bernie guy, I know, you know, if she was to get the backing of Bernie Sanders in her bid, mm-hmm. which I, I, I'm very sure that Bernie would be reluctant to do because he's built such a relationship with Biden right. and pushing his agenda forward. But if Bernie took that step forward, it would legitimize her as a candidate, in my opinion. But I feel like she already has a lot of great progressive ideas. Just unfortunately, the field was so crowded when she entered. Right. She really didn't have the standing. But she made a good point. She made a great point. And what she said is, if the founders of this great constitution that we have wanted the standard for a president to be higher, they would have made it. They would have pushed an amendment and they would have ratified it if they wanted it to be that way. But, you know, until Trump came along, I didn't realize how, just how low the standard for running <laughs> your country was. You know, Ray, Ray, you know, I, I, th- I think that all the time it's like, my God, that, you know, I, and, but you know what still gets me, Ray? And Johnny, I'm coming to you next. You know what still gets me, Ray? That people still, the news media talks about him as if he really is president material. And they would talk about an intelligent person that's going to college or high school. I mean, it, it drives me crazy when I when I see that. So you're you're absolutely right about that. Now Williamson has. I mean, I, uh, Williamson. If she were to make it, there 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 the attacks that are going to come specifically because she's a woman and because she has some alternate beliefs that has nothing to do with whether she'd make a good president or not. It's going to be astounding. And I was talking to her about that. I'm like, how are you going to overcome that? And, you know, and that sort of issue. So there's a whole lot of things like that, that that one has to worry about, Ray. But she's right about one thing. The one thing about the Republican Party mm-hmm. that I have to give them their due credit for is they actually let their primaries play out democratically. Yes, yes. They yes. have a super delegate system, you know, that BS. Yes stopgap that the Democrats put there so they make sure that they have control over the establishment candidate going right. And sometimes it might work where you might get someone like a Barack Obama who was against the grain when he was going against right. Hillary Clinton, but still all in all, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing that process play out with less influence from the superdelegates. As David would allude to, as, as you know, and as we do more of this, Ray, 
as you know, we have to do a lot more of this. And, you know, it's, it's funny because even last night I was on a conference call with, with, with somebody who uh, we we're talking about doing this stuff in Spanish to, 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 re because that's a, that's a, a huge untapped uh, voter market, if you will, that, that we have to hit. And if we hit it right, you know, we can start talking those issues that you talk about, those issues that Williamson talks about. If we can get to them before the Republicans fry their minds, or I should say before yeah. the conservative, the, 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 the MAGA, you know, fries their minds. Well, there's, a, there's great organizations like, uh, I'm just going to, you know, toot the horn real quick, like uh, Texas Organizing Project yes. that does do a yes. lot of jobs. Yes. Actually work across. Uh, Actually, I was on the board of, of, of that group for a while. So, yeah, they're, it's a very good group. You should come back, Edberto. We, we'd love to have you. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a great group. It's a great group, Ray. Um, but anyhow, my dear brother, anything else you have to say before I jump to Johnny? Oh, um, yeah. I just want to say a uh, big, big shout out for uh, Sheila Jackson Lee announcing her, mid, her bid for mayor. I was at that event on Friday. It was a beautiful event. I saw all my progressive friends. I didn't see you there, but I saw a good bit of my progressive friends mm -hmm. there, and it made me feel like I was around family again. I am going to try to get her in. I, I, I did the, I did the, uh, the, the debate on Wednesday with the five that showed up for the, for the, um, mayor, the Houston mayoral race. She, she sent in a tape. I wasn't happy with that because I think Sheila Jackson can hold her own. And I, I want to see her come and hold her own in the different conferences and forums that we intend to have throughout the city for, you know, with the different clubs. So I hope she comes out and holds her own because she has this. She has the gravitas, as it turns out. Oh, yeah. And, and Houston feels that I, I, I felt it when I was in that crowd. Right. Right. For sure. But you're right. She has to she has to come out. I mean. She's been in Washington for a mm -hmm. while, and now she's saying she's ready to come home. So you got to come home. You got to come back to the people. And I think over the next course of the year, we'll see where where you know where her energies will. Uh, will well, I, I, well, you know, I, I I'll I'll just tell folks right out. You know, I'm I'm generally not a fan of the establishment, but I really like her. I'll just tell you. And the reason I really like her is I went when I, and Johnny, I'm coming, but when I went to the, uh, to the, to the convention and I saw the interaction between her and the, her, the people in her district, I, you know, I, I, I left there, I left there with one and I got there with one impression and I left with another when I saw the interaction with community. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, truth be told, I felt like she laid, uh, across one of the most progressive genders I've mm -hmm. uh, heard for Houston mayor. Uh, I heard some stuff I like personally, like, so that's, that's one thing. And then I know, you know, another contender will be John Whitmire. And like I said, in your, uh, in your Facebook chat, he's a Dixie crack. Right. Um, it, oh, listen, I, I, I don't, I could never disagree with that, but there, uh, uh, you know, just let me take my host hat for off for a minute. My two contenders currently, in the, or the, the two folks that I like in the race are two women, Edwards and, and, and Lee. So there you go. Well, we're going to see. Uh, we see what the Houston people select. You have a great one, my dear brother. You take care and you keep listening, keep calling, all right? Absolutely. Take care, my friend. All right, let's go to brother Johnny. Johnny, come on in. Good afternoon, brother Egberto. Talk to me, sir. Three quick items in the interest of time. I'd like to just list them quickly. Yes. And then you can come at me, and I'll follow that with some practical advice for the audience. Yes, sir. Item number one, TikTok. As far as TikTok is concerned, I think we should apply justice as it should be applied. That is to say, evenly. You don't just go after TikTok. You go after Facebook and all the other social media platforms in this country. Otherwise, it's not justice. It's partisanship. And it's going to be perceived that way by some same morons who are easily offended snowflakes who have guns. Mm -hmm. Item number two, Williamson. She won't make it for one reason only. She's to the left of Bernie. And you know what they did to Bernie two election cycles in a row because we have to get rid of the centrists that dominate the Democratic Party. As long as they are in in place, no progress can be made in this country. We have to literally push them out of office and replace them, populate the Democratic Party with unapologetic 
unapologetic, aggressive progressives like the squad, then Williamson could be successful and it won't be a waste of our time. And we should also have a uh, uh, ranked choice voting, by the way. Number three, no apologies from you, Egberto. You don't need to apologize to anybody. I didn't hear you laugh this morning. And if you did, what's the big deal? We are coming across like snowflakes, easily uh, afraid of offending right-wingers, whether they're voters or listeners to left-wing media. This is how nothing changes. So you don't need to apologize for anybody. Do you have anything to say on that? Well, thank, well, thank you about that. Let me tell you, you know, you know the methods that I, that I use. I, I try to be kind to everybody. I, and, and my laugh with, with the person wasn't real. It was just like, oh, my God, I can't believe you do that. And I don't think I did apologize. That you're right about not needing to apologize when somebody says something as foolish as what the person said. Because I knew exactly what article the person was reading, um, Johnny. So, no, I didn't apologize to him. Uh, and, and, and I think I, I think what Steve was trying to say is, I, I want those people to call. I want those people to call. That, Trust uh, me. Yeah. Trust me, Berto. They're going to call. They're going to come to <laughs> more now because they can't stand people like me. They want to own me. And I'm okay with that if they think they can do it. Yeah, yeah. Here's some practical advice. The other day, last week or the week before, somebody on the right called into either your show or maybe Steve's show, and they talked about, oh, we need to have more political parties in this country. And they mentioned the <laughs> yes. Libertarians and Whigs. Yes. And I thought, well, number one, Libertarians are already a party. They exist. They're on the ballot all the damn yes. time. Plus, they're just another flavor of Republican. Yes. So what's the variety in there? Right. You're choosing between Coke and Pepsi. That's all you're doing. Here's my suggestion for these people to think about. How about we try no parties for a while? Now, we we're ta that? now you're talking my game. You see, you mentioned three things, right? The, I, I, I answered the three things. The, the third, the, the second one you talk about, we need to get folks, uh, the actual progressives into power that really support the people. I am there with you. I, I don't think there's anything that you said that I possibly could disagree with at all. So, you know, I mean, I, I think we're absolutely on the same wavelength. And the other, the good thing about progressives and what I try to tell other progressives as well, including you, my brother, is the following. And, I, I, and this is where I come across. Sometimes you guys get mad at me. I'm going to entertain absolutely everybody and I'm going to give everybody their opportunity to either enlighten us or make a fool of themselves. And I think that's what, that is what um, uh, disinfectant, that's what, when you use light as a disinfectant, when you expose them, that's why I don't Not like Donald Trump. Go ahead. Say that again. Not like Donald Trump though. No, no. You see, Donald Trump, I, I, listen, Donald, here's what happened with Donald Trump. And I, and I want, to, I, I want people to... Yeah, but hold on, hold on, Jenny. This is important, and I want everybody to hear this. Donald Trump, everybody in the beginning knew Donald Trump was a buffoon and did not understand much and was not very smart. Everybody knew that. People still know that. You heard some of the callers earlier this morning say that. What the media did, what the politicians did is they made that okay. There's a big difference between, uh, you know, people look up to other politicians, they look up to the media, they look up to professors, they look up to these other people. And when well, you, would, let me finish, let me finish. When you give Donald Trump plausibility, you give the rank and file, you give the masses permission to accept somebody like that to govern. I was about to, to disagree with you until you said plausibility. That's where you're correct. Yeah. Because they did not make it okay. What they did was they, uh, they gave him a halo. They put a halo above his head of being a, a legitimate right. candidate, an adult, exactly. a mature adult who had some substance in which he had zero. Exactly. And, 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 and again... They did that. And why did they do that? Why did both the corporate media as well as right-wing media and the leadership of both parties do this? CBS told you. They told you. CBS it's told because you. because of Bernie. Bernie was the only true populist candidate. And they are deathly afraid of socialism, evil socialism. But, but you know what else, too? The truth is, uh, the, uh, you know, Moonves Mum, from CBS also said it. He said, Donald Trump is terrible. But man, can he bring us in some money? 
you know, it's right. always you about capital my, and money. Yeah. You just made my point. Moonves, if you talked to him privately, he would think, he would try to convince you that socialism is not the way, even though you would have to educate him that we already have socialistic policies that rescue capitalism from time to time. Even hedge fund bunny Hillary Clinton herself on the debate stage with Trump mm -hmm. back in the day, dressed in her royal blue corporate pantsuit. She admitted on TV that from time to time, capitalism has to be rescued by socialism. So here's my solution. How about we try no political parties for one or two election cycles and require all private citizens running for office to stand on their own ground, defend their policies as individuals. Yeah. And let's see where the free marketplace of ideas takes us. That, you know, if you, if you believe in free markets, it's right. Go ahead, Hillary, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, Johnny, I just wanted to chime in and give you a high five on the no political parties. I mean, just at the theoretical level, political parties are anti-democratic because they concentrate yeah. power. Anything that concentrates power, whether it's banks or corporations or political parties, it's undemocratic. And then Hello. we get to the, the, the yeah, structural the level at the Constitution we've got, you know, the Constitution creates a special class of super citizens, representatives that, uh, you know, and that's another kind of concentration of power. You know, it divides power up yeah. between the three got branches it, it. and this and that, but it also concentrates power. And so we need to rethink uh, how our Congress has a, is a bottleneck Agreed. on power. I agree. We're going crazy on the phones. Uh, I hang up, I want to, before I hang up, I want to give one other gift, if you want to call it to the list. Go ahead, my dear. This is from our fellow uh, liberal, our brother on the left, David Pakman. Guys, Hello, please, hold on a second. Him? Guys, please call back. We accidentally hung the phone up. Please call back. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. Anyway, I got an email from him the other, uh, the other week, and I haven't linked to it yet. He's got a free, what he calls a white paper, on how to uh, talk to your relatives and friends and neighbors uh, about politics and other things in general, how to talk to them. And he gives you practical steps. I think it's one or two pages long. It's not very long. He calls it a white paper. It's uh, easy, easily read, easy to follow, user-friendly. And uh, I'm going to have to sue David Pakman. <laughs> but no, I know, I know David Pagman. The reason I said I'm teasing, but I'm saying that because that's the title of my book, man. <laughs> <laughs> Go by way of David Pakman. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Did did he did he is he really named the paper that? <laughs> it's a white paper. He, I know, but paper. that's the title of my book, man. <laughs> really? Anyway, on his email, he he sends you the email, and there's a link you could click on if you want to download it uh -huh. to your computer. And that's what I intend to do sometime this week if I can remember to. Okay. Well, anyway, my brother, thank you so kindly for calling, and I gotta do some speed re reading here to finish up the the two topics that we had uh, for the program. But folks, so don't forget if you call, I'll just send you to read the the newsletter that I've already written up for the show. But anyhow, uh, thank you, Johnny, for calling in, okay? Okay, my brother from another color. All right, my brother. Take care. 713-526-5738. I saw two calls come in that we missed. Uh, we, uh, sometimes we have a little phone problems here. Just give us a call back if you need to say something quick. Right now, I'll continue with our Discord issue real quickly. And I want to say this. Um, I'm going to finish this. Instead of reading it, you can go to politicsandright.com slash uh, newsletter to read it. But uh, what I want to say with the TikTok issues the following. Uh, the people, uh, you remember I said that our, the dangers come from within. Our corporate structure did all that is necessary to put us at the behest of China and other countries. We are the ones who chose to build all of our high tech, the most high technology chips, not here in the United States. We chose to build it offshore in Taiwan, China, and these other places, Malaysia. We chose that. That is what we chose, our highest form of technology. We chose to send it overseas because we didn't want to pay the American worker. And you want to talk glory, glory, hallelujah, who's patriotic now? You want to talk what economic system really works for you? Let's, let's continue. When it, comes to, uh, w when it comes to selling of information, all your American companies, our American companies, Facebook, Twitter, all these guys, every time you click something, and I don't care, I click, I don't mind if you want to know where I'm at, all that good stuff, but to, thought, but to believe that TikTok 
because it's owned by a Chinese company, will prevent China from having your data. The biggest culprits not going to be TikTok. The biggest cul culprits going to be all those people who want to make money on your eyeballs, which they sell. And you know what? Chinese companies are willing to buy your information. They don't need TikTok for that. They can get the aggregate of Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and all of these, these entities in one location, all aggregated together and sold to them and served up on a platter. This, this hoopla about TikTok is a sham. It is about taking out a foreign competitor out of the market. You believe in free markets and you want to get rid of TikTok. You know, I'm going to tell you something about TikTok. I love TikTok. TikTok presented a form, in my opinion, that lends to learning and it has so much information on there. Of course, everything you should verify. Actually, today I made a mistake on an article I posted at at, um, at Daily Coast. I corrected it, folks. So anybody who wrote that article at Daily Coast know that I fixed it. But anyhow, um, it turns out that anybody, anybody who wants to get your information, they can. Don't ever forget that they can. Is that going to be somebody coming over real quick? Uh, let's see. Come on. Uh, 713, come on over. You're on. Oh, hey, uh, Alberto, it's Colby. Colby, how you doing, sir? Doing well, doing well. Uh, I just wanted to touch on this topic about uh, TikTok. And, yes, sir. Uh, privacy stuff. Uh, I, I think that uh, TikTok is just a symptom of the problem. Yes. not the cause of the problem. Yes. Uh, I think uh, the real problem is privacy issues, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, is if we were to... Uh, just, just real quick, Colby, you got about 45 seconds because they're giving me a hard stop. So go ahead, Colby. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, instead of banning TikTok, mm -hmm. we should just change the privacy laws and enforce them across the board. Agreed. And if TikTok violates those laws, then we can ban it. Thank you. And that should apply to not only TikTok, but Twitter and everybody else in your opinion, correct? Absolutely. Thank you. You know, I mean, it, it's amazing how we can come up with sensible policy if we chose to do it sensibly, right, uh, <laughs> Colby? That's right. That's well, hard to find these days. I know. Well, thank you so kindly for calling in, Colby. I got to get out of here. All right. All right. Sounds good. Anyway, folks, I, I I hope you I hope you got the gist of today's today's program. Uh, w w you know, we had David Cobb in the beginning. Oh, one quick thing before we go out. I got about thirty seconds now. Okay, one minute. Okay, here we go. We will have. Will we ever get tired of this gun issue, folks? Are we tired of seeing our brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers shot up? We have to do something about it. I wanted to cover that today. Didn't quite get to it. We'll cover it another day this week. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. Thank you so kindly for your ears. And you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out! We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.